shower and cleans up and then he goes in and sits at the table with his cup of coffee and his Bible. Six and o'clock in the morning. That's his time with the Lord. Amen. And uh, I was getting cleaned up and I heard his guitar and I looked out and he's singing to the Lord and tears are just running down his face. And When he got through he could sense that I was staring at him and he looked up at me and I told him, I said, John D, I said, don't you change not one note not one line. I said, that came right from the throne. I love the Lord tonight for what he did for me. Lord, I sure do love you. You have been so good to me. You gave your life on Calvary so I could be set free. You've never, ever failed me. You've never let me down. When I'm in the deepest valley, I'm still on shouting ground. Generation meet some of that. Yeah. I know someday I'll see you. Woo! Yeah. I'll look up on your face and thank you there in person well, one day. for the day you took my place. Yeah. Woo! You showed how much you love me. Up on Calvary's tree, oh what a time of suffering you did that day for me. Lord, I sure do love you. You have been so good to me. You gave your life on Calvary, so I could be set free. You've never, ever failed me. You've never let me down. When I'm in the deepest valley, 
I'm still on shouting ground. Saint on the 4th of July. What about that? Amen. That's good for you, kids. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, well, everybody settle down now. Everybody outside. Let's go. Everybody in. Time for the preaching. Time for the preaching. This is sort of a, a festive sort of atmosphere. But you remember, we are at church. We're just as much in church right here tonight as we are on Sunday morning. Don't forget, this is God's house right now. And so we're gathered together to hear the Word of God. And so everybody get settled in. Let's go. All the folks outside, let's get in. Let's go. Uh, it's good to have all of you here. We won't take time to recognize all of our friends here tonight, but they're here from everywhere. We will be tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, during that Saturday evening, sir, tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. And uh, then tomorrow night at 6. That's the big one. Tomorrow night at 6, that's the big one. You don't want to miss that. So uh, don't miss the, tomorrow night, whatever you do. It's good to have all, all our family here tonight. A lot of my family's here. The friends, people I hadn't saw in a while. I'm out of state, different churches. And uh, my girl, people ask me all the time now, which one of them girls is yours? So all, three, all, three, all three of my girls stand up. My girls stand up right now, right quick. Hurry, hurry, hurry. I ain't got all day. Uh, all right. There's one, there's two, there's three. Go ahead, Ants. You're one of them, too. Uh, granddaughter, granddaughter, granddaughter. Anyway, we're glad all of them are here tonight. My sister, Debbie, raise your hand right there. Amen. She's really, really mean to me when I was a little kid. And uh, somehow the Lord helped me overcome it. Been mistreated when I was a child. That's what I blame all my sins on. But anyway, we're glad all of you are here tonight. God bless you for coming. Thank you, bus workers. Getting a lot of kids here tonight. We got a gang of kids here tonight. If they're a little unruly, I'll tell you what you do. Don't worry about it. You pray and ask the Lord to help you have the right kind of attitude. A kid got shot on their route this week, 17 years old. Where some of these kids come from, same apartment complex. 17-year-old boy got shot. He's still alive, but he's in bad, bad shape. And they'll be bringing kids here tomorrow from that neighborhood. Brother Ronnie be bringing out that whole bunch from Rock Hill. There's going to be a gang of kids here tomorrow night. So we are honored, privileged tonight to have Brother, Brother Spears with us. He needs no introduction here. He's getting ready to come. You pray for him. Thank God for Brother Barry Spears. Thank the Lord for what he's done in this man's life. God's using him all over the United States. He's going to come and bring the message, whatever God's given him. Amen. Get him on, fellas. Thank you, Pastor. It's a privilege to be here. Good looking crowd tonight. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule. Can I move this out of the way? Oh, well, don't worry about it then. Just move it. That's, you didn't have to do all that. Man, it's all good. Um, listen, I thank you, each one of you, for being here. Um, I know that you're going to have a great day tomorrow. I've already had a good time. I pulled in the park a lot and felt God. And you can tell people have been praying. Take your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter number 28 tonight. Isaiah chapter number 28. I do want to mind the Lord. We get right into the message. I feel like the Lord will have his way. Um, I appreciate my daughter being with me. Raise your hand, Alexis. She's 20, she'll be 22 in June. She acts like me, looks like me. It's terrible. And, uh, but she's a good girl. She decided to ride with me tonight. And uh, anytime I get my daughter to ride with me, I'm so proud of her. And um, y'all pray for Hammerdown Ministries in Lugoff or in uh, Elgin in Columbia area. We've started a rescue mission reaching out to drunks and drug addicts and all those kinds of people um, who can't help themselves. We're getting them to the man who can help them. His name is Jesus and he still knows what to do. It's not me and it's not you. We're just mouthpieces. For the Lord Jesus Christ. We're salt and we're light. That's all we are. But if you look around, I promise you in a crowd this size, there's at least a handful that are lost. They need the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't know what this is all about. I remember, um, I remember after I'd been in the world for a long time, for 13 years. And uh, of course, many of you know my testimony. I ended up a heroin addict. 
uh, riding with Hells Angels Motorcycle Club for over 13 years. I was out in the world, and uh, I know what it's like to go out there and get beat up and battered and tore up from the floor up, and to walk in a place like this and feel like a fish out of water. And, uh, but can I tell you something? What you see around you, what's going on in the atmosphere in the midst of this place tonight, you can get in on it. And if we could take what we've heard and what we've felt and put it in a bottle, we could put Budweiser out of business. Amen. If we could put it in a baggie, we could put every dope dealer, all the drug cartel, they wouldn't have any. Uh, they, wouldn't have, they wouldn't have anything to sell because we'd have it all. I don't know why in the world we're looking for a fifth of something or a gallon of something or a, an eight ball of something when we can get the whole well. Amen. Take your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter number 28. We'll begin reading in verse number 15. We'll read down through verse number 18. The Lord laid this on my heart. I've preached this message many times, but not sure why the Holy Ghost wants me to preach it tonight. But I believe if you'll pay attention that everyone will get a little bit of help. Stand with me. You'll be sitting for about 35 or 40 minutes. And I want you to stretch your legs for just a moment. I'd rather be in church than anywhere. Y'all heard, heard about the boy. Uh, mama woke up on Sunday morning, went to her son's room and said, you need to get up and get ready for church. He said, I'm not going to church and I'll give you two good reasons why. Number one, I don't like the people. Number two, the people don't like me. Mama said, well, I'll give you two good reasons why you're going to go to church. Number one, you're 49 years old. <laughs> Number two, you're the pastor. Get up and go to church. <laughs> you ever felt that way, preacher? All right. I asked my wife when her birthday was. She said, March 1st. So I walked around the room and asked her again. <laughs> Y'all get up about 2 o'clock in the morning to get something to drink. I get it now. <laughs> What did, what did the grape say when he got stepped on? Didn't say anything, just let out a little wine. All right, Isaiah chapter, y'all love them dad jokes. You love them. It's not the joke, it's just the, the guy telling it. He thinks it's funny and it's really not. All right, let's get serious. Because, verse 15, because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell. Are we at agreement? When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies. And the waters shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled. And your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. Look at chapter 29 and verse number 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. God says, listen, all those covenants with death and hell in chapter 28, all of your agreements that you come up with, you didn't get that junk from me. God says, all that stuff is man's ideology. Can I tell you we're living in a world uh, where there's no absolute truth anymore and we're raising a generation of young people that everything's relative, there's no final authority. Can I tell you there's still a King James Bible that tells us what the truth is and if we need to know about heaven and hell, we need to find out what God says about it. Let us pray. Father, tonight we love you. We thank you for everything that we've already seen and heard on these fairgrounds. Lord, I realize that the hour's getting late. The midnight hour is here. The pastor has already alluded to it. Things have gotten a whole lot worse than the last time we were here this time last year. Lord, we've got a generation of young people that are wandering around, groping in the darkness, trying to find something to fulfill a God-shaped void. They're trying to fill it with everything and anything they can other than Jesus Christ. I pray that tonight you'd have your way. Lord, I publicly admit 
that I need you. Lord, my vocal cords are, are uh, harmed by the pollen in the season. I pray that you'd strengthen me tonight. I publicly admit that I can do nothing without you. I lift up the blood-stained banner of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of the true and living God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob up against all the devils of hell. I ask you to allow the Holy Ghost of God take every word that I say and that's preached, saturate the atmosphere of this place, every air wave, every air molecule would be dominated by the Holy Ghost. Lord, I preach it, save souls, encourage the saints. No law but love, no creed but Christ, no price but the blood, and no book but the Bible. Have your way, Lord. Please help us. In Jesus' holy name we pray it. Amen and amen. You can have a seat. Man has tried to teach man about God and the truth for a long time. You'll find that men sit around and they chew the fat and Women stand around and they talk in the world and in the barber shops and the beauty shops and the Walmart parking lots and in the clubs and the social clubs and no doubt many times politics and religion comes up and you'll find that no one ever breaks out a Bible and says let's see what God has to say about heaven. Let's see what God has to say about hell and what men and women have been doing for a long time is having an agreement with death and they, they have got a covenant with hell and they've decided that they don't need God and what heaven is and what hell is and, and uh, they've, they've, they've gotten to the point where there's no absolute truth and if you were to ask the average sinner, what do you believe in reference to hell? You would get a variety of different answers that man has agreed upon. Well, I'll take over hell. Have you heard that one? I've heard some of the strongest men I've ever met. They think they're powerful enough to go to hell and take over hell. I've heard people say, well, there is no hell. Hell is here and now. We're living in hell. Well, hell is the grave or hell is a big party or hell is Gehenna. Hell is a trash pile outside of Jerusalem that's on fire. I've heard man has made an agreement with hell. But today, I want to borrow your imagination for a few moments. And with the help of the Holy Ghost, I I demand your attention. I don't want anybody getting up and walking out unless you absolutely have to. I want the Holy Spirit of the living God to use this message. I want to borrow your imagination. I want to create a what if in your mind. What if God, what if God Almighty let you sit in on a meeting that would change the rest of your life and the rest of your eternity? Just suppose that God summoned back to earth some people who were already in eternity. Some people who had already died and taken their last breath and their souls are in eternity this very moment. And God summoned those people back up from the grave to tell the truth about what hell and heaven is really all about. What is death really about? He calls them all together for a testimony meeting and he gives us all that are here a very special invitation to sit in and to listen and to observe these people that are coming back from eternity in the past and future. And he gives us all this invitation and so you get your ticket and the day arrives and your heart is racing and you pull up to the auditorium uh, to see a royal chariot in front of the chariot in front of the entrance. You think to yourself, that must be the Lord's. Uh, how beautiful and palatial that place looks. Uh, you walk up the sidewalk and they're expecting you. They know exactly who you are. You walk in and you're escorted to your assigned place of seating. The room is huge, very large. It's set up like a theater. Many, several thousand folks are there. And your chair is located next to several other people who are just as nervous and anxious to see this spectacular show as you are. The audience is packed with all kinds of people who have this special invitation to this life-changing event. The lights in the audience go dim. The spotlight hits the arena. And you're overwhelmed because much to your surprise, the God of heaven and earth is sitting on the stage at the head of the oval table. And much to your surprise, he's not an old man in a rocking chair. 
He's not broke down and hurt. He's not old and wrinkled up. He's not long haired, effeminate and sissy looking. Much to your surprise. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire, and his feet like as undefined brass, as if they burned in the furnace. And his voice has the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And much to your surprise, you see God Almighty in this place. All at once the King of glory stands to his feet and begins to call names. As he calls each name, that person immediately enters the arena through a set of double doors near the huge table set up in the theater. One by one they enter and they stand. The king calls the final name and he sits back down in his royal chair. At that time each person takes their seat. It's at that moment I'm thankful for a distance of safety between me and the stage area. Because what I see is absolutely terrifying to my eyes. With a loud voice of thunder, the King of Kings speaks. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you true testimonies from eternity. True testimonies from eternity. He turns and looks at the table of people that he's called back from eternity. And he says, at my command, I want each one of you to stand, state your name, and give your story. He begins to the right side and goes counterclockwise. The first man stands up and says, hello, my name is Cain, and this is my story. I lived in a time during uh, a time when the earth was still fresh and new. My mom made a bad choice and was deceived by Satan. God gave my mom and dad all of the trees of the garden to partake of, but there was that one tree he told them not to eat of. My mom made a bad choice, and my dad loved my mom. He loved her so much that he chose to give up perfection to be with her. So sin entered into the earth, and blood was shed to cover it. One day it was required of me to bring a sacrifice to God. I knew that he wanted a lamb, but I thought my way was better. My brother Abel brought the blood of the lamb. I brought the fruit of my field, my works, but God wouldn't accept my works in the field. I was so angry with my brother. I was so angry and jealous that I slew Abel, my brother, out of anger. And now I'll spend the rest of eternity in this place called hell. He turns to the audience and he says, by the way, folks, it's still the blood. It always has been the blood, and it always will be the blood. He says, audience, if you're trusting in anything but the blood, you're going to go to this awful place called hell. And he sits back down. The second man stands up. He's six foot eight, 375 pounds, all muscle. He says, hello, my name is... Barabbas, and this is my story. I was in prison for sedition and murder, but I wasn't always a murderer. Listen, young kids. I wasn't always a murderer. I was one time innocent. I was a normal kid, but I started hanging out with the wrong crowd. Here a little, and there a little. I didn't fit in with the goody goodies, but the gangs, boy, they sure did like me. You see, I loved to fight and cuss and brawl, and, and the bloods and the hell's angels and the pagans and the crips and the elks and the pagans and the mooses and the penguins. They all liked me. See, I was big and I was bad Barabbas. And so the goody goodies didn't like me, but one day at the wrong place at the wrong time, I, I killed a man. And they put me in prison for sedition and murder. I remember carving my own cross. I was sentenced to die. I was on death row, just days away from losing my life. The day arrived and I kept hearing a lot of commotion. I was trying to be a man about this whole death thing, but in the inside I was a kid, I was shaking, I was scared to death. 
I didn't really want to die. Deep inside, I was scared. I saw that Jesus man walk past my cell that day. He was bloody and beaten, and I thought to myself, as the meat was hanging off of his bones, his eyes were hanging out of the socket, his back was ripped and plowed, and man, you could see his organs on the inside, and there was a crown of thorns on his head. His face was black and blue, and spit was running down his face. And I remember thinking, my God, what could he have done to have been treated so badly? So badly. All of a sudden, my jail cell opened. A Roman soldier stepped in and said, Barabbas, you're a free man. I said, what do you mean I'm a free man? What happened? They said, Jesus, that man who just walked by your cell, he'll be taking your place today. I said, what did he do to deserve such a cruel crucifixion? That Roman soldier looked at me and he said, he's done nothing. He's done nothing wrong. But Barabbas, he's taken your place. He was guilty of loving me. Jesus gave me a second chance to live. Barabbas turns to the audience and he says, when I deserve justice, that Jesus man gave me mercy. Barabbas wipes the tears off of his face and he sits back down at the oval table. The third man stands up. He says, hello, my name is Judas and this is my story. See, back when I lived on the earth, I was a team player. Oh, I was so religious and lawful. I, I fooled 11 apostles that walked with God. I had a great position. I was the treasurer. I had much popularity. I was numbered with the 12 apostles. Oh, I had much pay. See, I held the purse and I took anything that I wanted from the money bag. I saw Jesus as he was baptized by John the Baptist. I witnessed the Lord Jesus turn the water into wine. I watched him as he healed the blind man. I watched him raise Lazarus from the dead. I watched him feed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves. I wanted to get saved, but pride kept me from truly accepting him as my savior. See, I had everyone fooled, but I couldn't fool that Jesus man. I couldn't fool him. I loved silver and I loved gold. So I sold out and I betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of sorry, low down silver. I kissed the door to heaven in betrayal. I kissed the bloody, sweaty face of Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. I felt so guilty. Oh, the guilt and the shame ate at me so bad for selling him out. I couldn't take it any longer. And so I killed myself. I hung myself and I plunged into eternity. A hypocrite. Judas turns to the crowd and he says, silver and gold may buy you a home, but your soul is worth much more than money can buy. Don't play games with the Son of God. And he sat back down. The fourth person stood, a beautiful young teenage girl, long blonde hair, nice complexion, but you could see something in her eyes she wanted to say to the audience. She stood up and she said, hello, my name is Dinah, and this is my story. My dad's name was Jacob. My brothers were the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. You can find my story in Genesis chapter number 34. God told my dad to go to Bethel, but he went to Shechem instead. I'll never forget the day that I looked over the fence out of the daughters of the land and I went out to see the daughters of the land. I wasn't happy under the umbrella of grace. I didn't like being raised in a Christian home. I thought I was missing out on something over the fence and so the day came that I jumped the fence and I went out to see the daughters of the land. I fell in love with King Shechem's son, the prince of Salem. I fell in love with him and he fell in love with me. As time had it, he defiled me. He talked me into getting to the back seat of his vehicle and I gave my purity away. I wanted to marry him and he wanted to marry me. I knew it wasn't right. I knew he was not 
of, uh, of our family and he was not uh, of the household of faith but I have already fallen in love with him and, and he defiled me and I'll never forget my two brothers coming out and, and deceived that entire place. The town that I was living in. Why my two brothers told all the men that they would circumcise themselves and get under the Abrahamic covenant that they would come in and, and create a league with them and we would all just mix multitude, but they were lying. And when they were feverish and healing from that circumcision, my two brothers came in and cold-blooded murdered every man and boy in that town. Oh, it was a terrible sight. They come running through with their swords, killing men and boys, threw me on the back of the horse and hauled me out of town and I remember sitting in my father's tent as Jacob was sitting there and I was laying on the couch with mascara running down my face. I was weeping and crying as my two brothers Simeon and Levi were standing in front of my father with their swords drawn and blood dripping from their hands and blood dripping from their bodies. Oh, I could hear the crying and the weeping of the women and the children as the husbands and daddies had been cold-blooded murdered by my two brothers. I could see the smoke coming up from Salem. I could hear the lowing of the cattle and the spoil. And I remember thinking, my God, it was not worth it to go into the far country. As Dinah looks out at the audience of young girls, oh yes, I was forgiven. Oh, life went on. Yes, life went on. But my life was consumed with regret and remorse for what I had done. I let a lot of people down. Many people lost their lives because of my worldly desires. She turns to the audience and she says, young ladies, listen to God. Listen to his words. Listen to your preacher. Listen to mom and dad. Don't play games with the world. Stay pure. Leave the Philistines alone. Listen to the man of God, I beg you. And Dinah sits back down. About that time, the next one in order stood. This is the one that I was most dreading. He was the source of the awful stench, the awful smell that had permeated the entire theater. Why, it smelled like brimstone and rotting flesh and smoke that was, it was just saturating the airwaves. This man stands up. His eyes are sunk back in his head. Blisters and burns all over his body. Maggots and worms crawling in and out of his chest cavity. His tongue is shredded and mutilated and parched. His body is still twitching and thrashing. He can't even hold still. He stands the best that he can. And he says, hello, my name is Rich Man. And this is my story. I fared sumptuously every day. I was rich. I ate the best. I rode in the best. Why, I wore the best. And every day there was a poor beggar named Lazarus which sat at my gate. Well, I never helped him. I, I simply wished he would just go somewhere else and beg. I claimed to love God, but I couldn't love that beggar. Oh, no. He wasn't as well off as me. One day unexpectedly, I took my last breath and I lifted up my eyes in hell after my body was buried. And for thousands of years, I've been in torment I remember watching my funeral as God rolled back the curtain in my mind and I began to watch my own funeral from this awful place and they laid my body in the finest casket. They clothed my dead corpse with a $5,000 suit. Johnson and Murphy shoes put a Mont Blanc pin in my pocket while my hair was done up nicely. The royal horses and the fine wine and the musicians were there. The entire town shut down for my funeral. Why, the president was there the Pope was there and the president even said a few words at my eulogy. They all said I was in a better place. They said I would never suffer again. They said I was in heaven with God. But under their very feet, I was screaming and gnawing my tongue. Worms were eating my body and I was in the greatest pain that I've ever felt. He turned to the audience and said, 
Jesus said, how can you love God who you can't see if you can't love your neighbor who you can see? And he sat down. The sixth person, person stood up. She said, hello, my name is Marilyn Monroe. This is my story. I was once a beautiful young girl, innocent and pure, but I sold myself to the public to view my sensual naked body. Why I got rich almost overnight. Millions of men lusted after those pictures. Not long before they found my new dead body in that room, a preacher man named Billy Graham told me that I needed to be born again. He told me I was a sinner in need of a savior. But I laughed at him and joked with him. My friends were around and I, I made him leave. Oh, I wish I could go back and do it over. I wish I could go back to that moment and say, Dr. Graham, tell me how I can know this man named Jesus. I want to repent of my sins. But I did it and I can't. I can't go back. I can't go back. She turned to the audience and said, don't sell your soul to Satan. Don't put off repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, and she sat down. The next one stood, and with a gravely, with a gravely voice, he said, hello, my name is Bon Scott. This is my story. I was the lead singer of a rock and roll band called ACDC. On July the 27th, 1979, I released a song that I had written and it was called Highway to Hell. The lyrics went living easy, living free, season ticket on a one-way ride, asking nothing, leave me be, taking everything in my stride. I don't need reason, I don't need right, ain't nothing I would rather do. I'm going down to party time. My friends are gonna be there too. I'm on the highway to hell. No stop signs, speed limits. Nobody's gonna slow me down. Like a wheel, I'm going to spin it. Nobody's going to mess me around. Hey, Satan, I paid my dues playing in this rocking band. Hey, mama, look at me. I'm on my way to the promised land. I'm on the highway to hell. I wrote the lyrics, and it went straight to number one. Hundreds and thousands of people began to be intoxicated by the powerful influence of this song. But I submit to you that six months after writing this song, six months after this song went to number one, February the 19th of 1980, I took my last breath. Why I turned, I took my last breath. I had been drinking all night and passed out in a vehicle in front of my buddy's house as he went in to sleep in his bed. I choked on my own vomit that last that night. There's no good times in hell. How can I tell you when I woke up in hell? I wish I wasn't on the highway to hell. Hey, there's no parties. There's no good times. There's no rock and roll bands. It's not a place you want to go to. Oh, I was deceived by Satan. And the lyrics and the music has deceived hundreds of thousands of young people. He said, I submit to you. You do not want to be on this highway to hell. It was a lie. I was deceived. Don't get on the highway to hell. Trust Jesus. And he sat down in shame. Then Frank Sinatra and Michael Jackson, Kurt Cobain, John Lennon, Robin Williams, Each one of them stood and said, don't sell your soul to fame and fortune. A few years on earth with fame and fortune is not worth eternity in this place called hell. Don't come to this place. And all at once, the atmosphere begins to change. The king of glory begins to smile. He looks on the other side of the table. And he gives a nod as if to say, I've been waiting on this one. A humble, reverent man stands slowly. He can barely see or speak because tears are rolling down his face. He's trembling and he's overwhelmed. He says, hello, 
My name used to be Legion, but I've got a new name now. Oh yeah, this is my story. As a teen, I started listening to the wrong influence. I began to listen to Hollywood and Oprah Winbag and Dr. Feelgood. I began to listen to Ozzy Osbourne and Led Zeppelin. And I went the gothic route. Oh, I, I began to play around with Harry Potter and Ouija boards and the gothic crowd and, and tarot cards and Twilight and zombies and ghost hunters and horror movies. I ended up on antidepressants and alcohol and all the, all the music of the world. I began cutting myself and breaking chains. They tried to calm me down and they tried to put me in my place with fetters and chains and handcuffs. They took me all over to NA and AA and AAA and all the places, all the charter rivers and, and all the psychologists. They did their best, but I continued to break the chains. They could do nothing with me. I was a mental wreck. I was foaming at the mouth. I had supernatural power. The devils of hell had eaten up my body and my life. I was a menace to society. Oh, I got from bad to worse. All hell was eating me up. I was sent to a place called Gadara, simply out of society's view. They couldn't deal with me anymore, but can I tell you how strong I was? They would put logging chains on me and I would break them right in front of their face. They begin to get scared of me. And so they drove me into a graveyard. Let me tell you how bad my life got when I was legion. I was eating with dead people. I would talk to dead people. I was sleeping in the tombs with dead people. Everywhere I went, it was death, death, death. I was fine to be left alone. I was one of those people. Hey, I didn't want to listen to what nobody had to say. I done figured out I'd live my life my way. Hey, there was no help for me. But then there was this one day. <laughs> I was standing out by the seashore of Galilee. And one of the greatest storms I've ever seen in my life began to come over that sea. And I saw this boat out in the middle of the water. I said, they're as crazy as I am. They're going to die. They'll be over here with me. You better get out of this storm. But they didn't turn around. I began to watch and laugh. I thought there'll be more dead bodies floating up before long and I'll have my way with them. Well, I'll cut them too. But all of a sudden in the midst of that storm, there was a man whom I've never seen before. He stepped out on the bow of that ship and I don't know what he said, but he put his hands up in the air and he, he said something like, peace be still. And all of a sudden the storm became a calm and the waves laid down and became like a sea of glass. And I began to think to myself, what kind of man is this? What manner of man is this? If he's got that kind of power over the storms, maybe there is help for me. Hey man, over here, over here. And can you believe that man and that ship came right to where I was. <laughs> oh, Legion said, I don't know. I didn't know what was getting ready to happen, but it sure changed my life. As I walked up to this man, his name was Jesus, come to find out. I began to walk up with thousands of devils eating my body up. And that man named Jesus said, go! And every devil in my life, every devil and every demon in my body had to flee into a herd of swine. And they went down a hill violently and choked in the water. And ever since that day, I've been healed and clothed and in my right mind. Can I tell you something, church? That was me. That was Barry Spears. I remember going the wrong way. I remember telling the church, you can take it and do what you want to do with it. I'm going my direction. I remember taking my first pill, my first drink, uh, snorting my first line, shooting up the first time, uh, joining the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, uh, and 13 years later, uh, I was as far down as a man could get. Uh, I woke up in the clubhouse thinking, my God, how did I get so far away from the truth? I thought there's no help for me. Mom and dad couldn't help me. I didn't threaten to shoot the preacher and all of his deacons, literally. I've been shot, stabbed, and left for dead. I was hooked on narcotics and heroin, methadone, subutex, suboxone, cocaine, whiskey, the club life, everything that was available. It had me locked down. I thought I would die high. I remember looking in the mirror one time. My son was 10 years old. Alexis was two. 
I looked in the mirror and I said, God, kill me. I can't live anymore. I can't get off this dope. You don't just put heroin and meth down. I said, God, just let me do a great big line of cocaine while I'm high on heroin. I'll speedball, my heart will quit. I'll go to hell and this life will be over. But God had better plans. See, what I didn't know is while I was partying and I was full of the devil, my mom and dad and my wife were praying and my children were going to Sunday school praying for their daddy. And then I tell you that October the 27th, 2003, about 9.30 in the morning, King Jesus came my direction. And I just looked up to Jesus. I said, God, if you can do something with me, if you got that kind of power, Lord, here I am. And he showed up and he showed off. I went down a beggar, baby, and come up a millionaire. Every devil in my house had to flee at the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. Woo! You ask me why I'm happy, I'll tell you why. You had to see where I came from, man. My body's covered with tattoos and scars. I don't even like taking my shirt off in front of my wife. Oh, the trash that's all over my back and my shoulders and my chest. Can I tell you when Jesus saved my soul, he began to turn a mess into a message. I handed in the ashes of a burnt down life and God said, I'll, break a, I'll make an army out of it. I had to go, I had to pick up the broken pieces. And I said, God, here they are. And here I am 20 years later preaching and pastoring. You know what that is? That's the grace of God Almighty. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> I feel like throwing something. <laughs> Praise God. Listen, I told my daughter. I said, that dude right there is as close as you're going to get to your daddy as far as the crazy level. <laughs> I've, been, I've been known to headbutt stuff while I was preaching. Didn't even know I was doing it. My wife said, didn't that hurt? I said, I don't even remember doing it. <laughs> oh, Legion! Turns to the audience. He says, I'm glad that Jesus came my way. Because I'll spend forever with him. While the rich man who had it all together is spending eternity in hell. Legion who they had outcast because there was no hope is in a beautiful place called heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he sat down. Silence began to fill the audience. Tears began to roll down people's faces. Rahab begins to stand up and tell her story. Then Ruth tells her story. Queen Esther begins to tell her story. After the last testimony was heard, God Almighty, the judge of all the earth, turns and looks at the audience. Now listen. He says, now you tell me, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be as crimson, they shall be like wool. I believe that God is speaking today. I believe he's speaking tonight through the testimonies that we have pulled up to this wonderful event called True Testimonies from Eternity. I believe that through Testimonies of millions of people that we have heard of and known. People who have made bad choices and people who have made good choices. Hebrews 11, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. I believe if God could pull more people back from the dead and let them speak tonight, we would be mesmerized. Nobody would be preoccupied with the bills and the job and school. We would be glued to the King of Kings. But I submit to you tonight, what's it going to take, young person, to get you to understand, to remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth? You listen to people who's been there. They've made the bad choices like Barry Spears. I do not want to glorify my past. If you think you need a testimony like mine, Sue your brain for non-support. Every day of my life, I battle physical ailments, spiritual ailments, mental problems, all kinds of things I deal with. 
because of my past. Oh yeah, God can use you, but the scars will remain. I want you to stand with me, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father, as the pastor comes, I'm wore out. I believe that you're speaking tonight. Lord, there's a young person here who's been deceived by Hollywood and the music that hell is a place of a party. If you could flip the lid off of hell for about 10 seconds and let everybody walk by and see what hell's really like. Nobody would walk out that door and get another drink. Nobody would go back to their old lifestyle. Every person here would be on this altar begging God to save them or thanking you for having already done so. God, flip the lid off of hell in somebody's mind. Let the fear of God fill this place as we give this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Pastor, the service is yours. Our heads are still bowed now. Eyes are still closed. God is speaking to your heart here this evening. There's no accident that he brought this message tonight. If you're here tonight and you don't know you're saved, this is your time to come. If you're here tonight and you have been saved, but you're not living right, it's your time to come. We're going to give an invitation tonight. Uh, young people, mamas, daddies, I just get in this altar tonight and pray. Pray for our loved ones. Pray for our homes. Pray for our families that will wind up in hell if they're not saved. Let's do that right now. Father, do what ought to be done right now in Jesus' name. Amen.